Hey, my name is Dr. Ruthie, or Dr. Ruth Neustifter, if you feel like pronouncing a big, long German last name. I'm a professional sexuality educator, and I blog over at exploringintimacy.com. I am also an author. I have written The Nice Girl's Guide to Talking Dirty, but today I'm here thanks to the great folks at funwares.com answering your questions about sex and relationships. You want to send me a question? Great. I want to get your question. You can email it to me at AskDrRuthie, uh, spelled with an I-E, at funwares.com, or you can tweet me if it's a shorty at DrRuthie, D-R-R-U-T-H-I-E. I have a great question here, um, and it just made me so happy. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but this particular guy, um, young man, was um, writing me a question, and then he just wrote me the nicest compliment afterwards. I'm really happy that I'm able to provide these educational videos, so thank you for your kind words about it, and, and also cred to funwares.com. Um, it's few and far between that you find a business that is willing to support um, high-quality sexuality educators to do public outreach like this. So um, make sure you say thank you to them, too. So I really appreciate that. Um, okay, yay. Good. Um, our love-in is successful. So let's go ahead to your question. Dear Dr. Ruthie, is it possible for those who have undergone surgery for anal fissure repair to ever return to a healthy anal sex life? I'm 24 years old, gay male, who's currently recovering from my second said surgery. Um, this is a really good question, and I want to address this as an anal health question. Um, the first thing I have to just repeat from the beginning of this video is that I'm not a physician or a medical doctor. I'm not an MD. I'm a PhD. And it's in child and family development, the mental and emotional and relational kind, not the physical kind, um, and also um, with a doctoral certificate in mental health. So that's my background. So what I did for this question is I went to the interwebs to some um, really trustworthy sites, and I also called some friends of mine who are nurses and doctors um, because they all work in a little more straight-laced kind of environments. They, um, ooh, no pun intended, they um, preferred not to, to have their name or their interview be on the study, So, or excuse me, on this video. So that is where this information came from. And so that segues into the next part, which is that uh, I strongly, strongly encourage you to have, um, if you have a primary caregiver, a, a doctor, you know, a family doctor, a primary physician that you work with, to have one that you can ask these sort of questions to, because uh, because that's what I'm about to tell you to do. If your doctor is not that person, um, and you know you you've had surgery a couple of times, so. Hopefully your surgeon or the nurses who assist your surgeon might be those kind of people too. Um, if they're not, we need to find you somebody who is. I don't know where in the world you're located, but um, if you're somewhere in North America and lots of other countries too, there are some great GLBT health centers, um, gay and lesbian, um, bisexual, trans, queer, you know, all the letters of the rainbow, um, health centers that have physicians there that can give you more information because what you're describing um, is not super duper common. I don't want to, you know, scare people who haven't had this situation, but it's, it's not terribly rare either. So this is a question that people want to ask. Now, um, in doing my research and, and talking with the folks that I talk to, they strongly encourage to have that kind of um, communication with your doctor or physician. If that just isn't available where you're located, take a look online, look for some reviews for some good places, and call them and ask if they can talk with you over the phone to give you advice on this situation. Because they said there's some really important questions for you to consider. One of them is, do you have some sort of genetic or physical predisposition to anal fissures? Um, which is, by the way, for folks who don't know, this is a tear that can happen in the anus or just inside the anus. And then um, oftentimes these things heal on their own, but if it's really kind of bad or it gets infected, there has to be a surgery and then a healing, he healing period afterwards. Um, and if you have some sort of predisposition this way, you're going to have to learn to have sex in a way that's really cautious and careful and, and goes above and beyond the normal recommendations for safe sex. If this is, um, if you don't have any kind of physical predisposition, although your body may have some weaker spots where the surgery is now, and it's just that you've been having anal sex too hard and too fast for a typical body to take without having tears like this, um, then we also need to look at, at safer, um, safer ways for you to go about this. And I mean safe in a couple of different ways. The first of all is that any time that you're having breaks in the body tissue, we really have to be cautious about sexually transmitted infections. Um, that includes HIV and lots of other ones as well. If you are already HIV positive or positive for any other chronic, long-term sexually transmitted infection, you still need to be really careful, A, not to give it to partners, 
um, and B, not to um, get other kinds of infections that will further complicate your health situation. It is not safe for someone with HIV to have risky sex with someone else who has HIV because there's lots of little variations in the type of HIV infection. So um, you, can, you can actually cause further problems for yourself. It's just like folks who have herpes sometimes believe that they can only have sex with other people who have herpes, but in, in reality they could be getting into a situation where they're triggering each other's herpes and giving each other multiple simplexes. That's, that's not good. Um, so we want to be careful in that way. We also just want to be careful for the health and safety of your body. To answer your question, there's a very high likelihood that you can enjoy anal stimulation again once you're healed up really well and in doing it in a safe and careful manner. My cat wants to come in and let you know that um, he's in your corner as well. Um, so what we're talking about in this situation is finding a lubricant that's safe and healthy for your body. Do your research. Not every kind of mainstream lubricant out there is safe and healthy. You want one that's not likely to carry bacteria or have difficulty washing out of the body. Oil-based lubricants can be really popular, especially for um, anal sex in the gay community that is particularly vigorous and rigorous. Um, but those kinds of oil-based lubricants can harbor bacteria, and we already have a sensitive system and situation. You don't want to get started again until you're fully healed, until your doctor gives you the okay, and you want to talk with them about that. Um, you're going to want to go really slowly and gently. And what we may be looking at doing is if you've been having particularly rigorous anal penetration, is toning it down a notch. And, and I apologize if that's something you really, really love to do. Um, obviously it's not so good for you, um, if, but that hasn't been what you've been doing, carefully assess whether you've been going slowly, gently, lots of lube, working your way up slowly, and giving your body adequate time to rest and recover between. Um, without more information and without having a medical degree, I'm afraid I can't go into any more detail um, because it's kind of exceeding my knowledge base. But that's the information that the medical folks I talked to suggested that I bring forward. But their biggest, biggest suggestion was that you talk to your own medical professionals and get the personalized advice that you need. But I wanted to let you know that um, this is not a hopeless situation. It's just a situation that calls for good education and treating your body really well and learning the ways that you need to treat your body in order to make sure that we don't have to have a, a third operation on the table. Or if this is something that your body is predisposed to that we're, we're really treating it carefully to really um, delay that happening if, if you have something where that's, that might be an eventual no matter what. Um, and to remember that there's lots of great anal pleasure to be had, you know, at the external area of the anus that doesn't cause any stretching or anything like that, and perhaps working up more in that way it can be on the table. Lots of exploration. Talk to your medical folks, see what they have to say. I hope that you get back to me. I would love to hear how things are moving forward for you. And uh, Omar and I will see you at the next video. Bye-bye.